Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here at this conference and to give you an overview uh, on the LSD research in Switzerland and particularly in Basel. As you all know, LSD was uh, uh, detected, you could say, in Basel, and so it's a particular pleasure to continue to do research on this substance in our city. Why do we do this? Why do we do psychedelic research? We started actually mainly with MDMA, and initially we focused on describing what is going on in the recreational use by having more controlled settings. We investigated MDMA in placebo-controlled studies, so there was no therapeutic aim initially. Um, there were, for example, Franz Vollenweider, mostly in Switzerland, with a focus on using these substances to model psychotic um, states, or later on, possibly mostly, Robin uh, 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 Carhart Harris with his um, view on the mind and, and uh, trying to get more insight into the mind by using these substances. Our focus was more descriptive, recreational use, and increasingly providing data for clinical studies. Um, there is now, of course, a lot of preliminary uh, data on efficacy, especially for MDMA and for psilocybin, less so on LSD. And there are phase three studies going on for MDMA and uh, started also for psilocybin. You have heard about such plans. And at the same time, there is still a lack of phase one study data, meaning how well are these substances tolerated, how uh, do healthy subjects react to them psychologically? What would be the ideal dose? What, are, what is happening if other medications are co-used and so on? So usually, whenever you want to bring a medication to the market and go to phase two and three, which are the phases where you study a medication in patients, you will, besides this, have to do many studies in healthy subjects. Um, and we are well placed to do these studies because we are clinical pharmacologists, so usually we do develop medications and are dealing with, with such uh, issues, and here we are just focusing on psychedelic substances and use our usual skill set to test these uh, drugs. Finally, in Switzerland, there is already limited medical use, sometimes labeled compassionate use, of MDMA and LSD in patients, although there are maybe even for indications where there are no um, where there are no clinical studies. This is an exception, as, as far as I know, Switzerland is the only country where this is happening, so we can already treat selected patients with PTSD, depression, anxiety, with MDMA or LSD. This is currently being done, but at the same time, there is still a lack of data, as you know. So this, these are currently the main rationals why we are doing this research in Basel. You have heard about this, LSD, um, many people have an LSD experience, this is data from the US, and of course this increases um, over or with, the, with, with your age, so people at 30 to 50 years of age have maybe uh, 10 to 20 percent of them have uh, used LSD at least once. So many people have experience with these with this substances. This is one reason why we studied these substances. And this was actually a key study that led me to start doing LSD research. So there is a psychiatrist in Switzerland, Peter Gosser, he will also give a a talk at this conference, and already in, in, in uh, 10 years ago, with the support of MAPS, he conducted a small clinical study in patients. So this was the first study in the modern area, you could say, using LSD in patients. And all these patients had a life-threatening disease, mostly cancer, and he and had anxiety as well, and he treated them with two doses of LSD uh, at a relatively high dose. And as you can see, um, their anxiety went down a little bit, and in the placebo group down here, there was actually a very small placebo group, that nothing happened, and then they, the placebo people 
crossed over to the LSD treatment and also they improved a little bit regarding their anxiety. And one year later, uh, he had nine subjects still living or available for the follow-up and they all showed lower anxiety scores. So this was preliminary data because it's not a fully controlled, placebo-controlled study. And it was the, the, the first study using LSD. And interestingly for me, he, he went into patients directly. At the same time, we had no real uh, valid data on the so-called pharmacokinetics of LSD. We had no idea what is going on in the brain. We had no imaging studies. Now we have imaging studies from London, from, from Zurich, from Basel. Uh, at the time, he started in patients. And I said, well, that's strange. A private practitioner, a psychiatrist in his little office, starting such research. I mean, we are far behind academically. Now we should also do something here. And we were experienced with uh, doing research with him and decided to then also study LSD. Um, this was already shown, and I will mention this important clinical study, a phase two study with psilocybin, to illustrate that we have an acute effect um, with psilocybin, shown here, and then um, a long-term therapeutic response, a decrease in depression scores. These were patients with uh, depression and anxiety and also cancer. So we, they saw a decrease in depression score greater than with the placebo, which was a very low dose of psilocybin. Then the people on the on placebo also switched to the treatment and they also decreased regarding their depression. And the same was observed for anxiety here. And importantly, they linked the acute effect with the long-term response, as you can see here. And acutely they measured mystical type experiences and they saw that a greater experiences, greater mystical type experiences, we'll come back to this, what that could mean, was, uh, such as, uh, was associated with a better outcome long-term after several weeks regarding the anxiety and also depression. So there must be a link between the acute experience if it's more beautiful, typically, they saw better responses therapeutically um, in these patients. Similarly, in the study uh, done by Robin Carhart Harris and uh, David Knott in London, um, they treated patients with treatment-resistant depression, a small study. You see a lot of variance in the response. These are the single patients, but they typically went down with the psilocybin treatment, and there they, they was a sustained response in, in some of them, also partial relapse in others. If you look at the means overall in the entire population, there was a, a nice response, actually, reduced depression, um, a, a large treatment effect. However, keep in mind, there's no placebo control. So we don't know whether this would also have happened with, with placebo, but nevertheless, these were depressed patients and a surprisingly strong response. So this is nice preliminary data for further studies and certainly a basis for the study that is now conceived in Germany. And again, what they did and was interesting for us, um, they looked at the acute response again, using another scale, which is used actually by all the research groups doing such research. And they uh, used the five dimensions of altered states of consciousness scale. Um, and there are different dimensions and sub-dimensions within these dimensions. And they saw that those subjects who responded to the treatment had a more pleasurable acute response, including an experience of unity, more spiritual experience, typically also a state of bliss and insight. So this is sometimes labeled uh, oceanic boundlessness, this entire dim dimension. So those who had a lot of bliss, an overall greater response, so the blue, curve, the blue area is bigger than the red one, showed a, a therapeutic response, and the other ones that had a lower response, acute response, um, and on the other hand, more anxiety, they showed no therapeutic response weeks after the treatment. So the acute state, if it's more pleasurable, more bliss, seems to predict the 
therapeutic outcome. And this is also shown here, more uh, oceanic boundlessness is correlated with a better therapeutic response, less anxiety is correlated with the therapeutic response, um, no placebo control, but importantly for us, we thought, okay, this is interesting, we can actually already measure in healthy subjects, we can already measure the acute effects, this is unique. Usually in a phase one study you cannot measure the therapeutic outcome, but we have a surrogate of the later therapeutic outcome in patients which we can already assess in healthy subjects. Okay, what are the studies that are being done? There is um, the LSD study that I showed you from Peter Gosso is the only one that's, uh, that has been completed so far. There are no other therapeutic studies currently completed or published in the modern research area. There is a lot of data uh, from the 60s, of course. What are uh, LSD studies that have been completed in healthy subjects? Um, there has been one in Basel with 200 micrograms of LSD in 16 subjects, or a high dose. Then we did a study with a lower dose, half the dose in a somewhat larger sample, and also including MRI measurements. So only a lower dose could be, uh, could be used in the MRI scanner. And then uh, we performed and completed already another study where we directly compared the effects of LSD with MDMA and amphetamine. So these are the prototypical substances, the hallucinogen or psychedelic, MDMA, the antoctogen, and then the amphetamine, the stimulant, directly compared with the same subjects. There was another MRI study in Zurich and two studies in London and just published a uh, study using very small doses, small doses, maybe microdoses, small doses of LSD in healthy subjects as well. We'll have a look at these data. Um, what do the subjects experience when we treat them with LSD? And we can already assess this during the state. Most of the measurements can only be done afterwards, as you know, as the state is so overwhelming. However, we can ask people, while they're under the influence of the substance, how big is your drug effect? Is it positive? Is it negative? So this usually you can you can uh, indicate even on a scale from zero to a hundred. You can make a small mark, and you can see that LSD lasts a 200 microgram dose, it's a relatively large dose, lasts uh, an entire day, almost 16 hours in some subjects. You can see that it is mostly pleasurable, so good drug effect, these are the means of the good drug effect assessed uh, every hour approximately, and here we have bad drug effects such as anxiety. So four subjects here, had anxiety of at least 50%. So you could say a, a fourth of all the subjects also had anxiety. However, if you look at the good drug effects, all the subjects actually had good drug effects as well. So even the ones that had anxiety uh, during the peak experience felt that they had at the same time or close by uh, a, a really good drug effect. So this is the, the, the overall picture. And if we compare this, for example, with uh, MDMA and amphetamine, the any drug effect of 100 micrograms of LSD, this is now 100 only, compared to MDMA, the green curve, MDMA was dosed at 125 milligrams, which is essentially the, the biggest dose that we give therapeutically, whereas for the LSD we could get, go higher up. Nevertheless, LSD produces an overall more marked response than MDMA or amphetamine. You can see that there is the typical ego dissolution with LSD, uh, but only a little bit with MDMA and not at all with amphetamine. Subjects feel happy with MDMA as well as with LSD, so there is some resemblance of the state. And they feel very talkative, as also the supervisors or sitters uh, remember. Uh, only the ones on amphetamine, actually, and the MDMA a little bit, whereas the ones on LSD stay quiet and more introverted. So there are some aspects that are clearly highly different and others that are similar. And overall, the LSD experience is simply more overwhelming and stronger than what we see with the other compounds. Um, more specifically, we can assess the LSD experience using these five dimensions of altered states of consciousness scale, and you can see the pleasurable effects of 200 micrograms, 
and the, here of 100 micrograms in this scale, and we see very high ratings. So I enjoyed boundless pleasure is the mean of this, of this item is at 82%, and more than half of the subjects indicate 100%. So they could not think of more pleasure than what they experienced during this state. Maybe there is more, but uh, at least they label it like this. Then the other typical LSD effect is the synesthesia they experience. So these are items like and each of these items is a single visual analog scale within this scale. Sounds seem to influence what I saw. The shapes of things seem to change by sounds and noises. The colors of things seem to change by sounds. Again, very high ratings at the 200 microgram dose. And more than half indicate this is maximum of what I ever thought would be possible. And there is actually more synesthesia with the 200 microgram dose compared to the 100 microgram dose, but these differences were seen in different studies and different people. So the two doses were not given in the same subjects, but in different studies. Um, the same scale has now been used in a what you could call a microdosing study. That would be the first maybe so-called microdosing study using low doses of LSD compared to placebo in the same subjects even. So each of the, I think it were 20 subjects, got all three doses. Zero micrograms, 6.2, 13 and 26. The study was performed by Horiette De Witt and uh, Anya Berchard in Chicago. And they used the same scale that I just uh, showed you with uh, the higher doses that were used in Basel. What did they see? They saw dose-dependent increases in blissful state. Actually, over all the scales, you see dose-dependent increases. Even at 13 micrograms of LSD, you would have 7% bliss on a scale from 0 to 100. At 26 micrograms, they had 13%. We measured 40% bliss, if you want, on the scale with 100 micrograms and 70% bliss with 200 micrograms. So this is, I would say, fully dose dependent. The effects of small doses of LSD acutely are exactly the same as the ones of high doses. It's just much less on this scale. So if somebody can show me a creativity scale where creativity goes up, usually, or let's say concentration goes up, I don't know. We see decreases in concentration at higher doses. I would expect the same with the lower doses. And also with these lower doses. So a microdose is a dose that you would not feel subjectively, but it may have some other effects, maybe. Well, they felt what they felt. Uh, or at least they rec in the study, they saw significant differences between placebo and these low doses of LSD, and they called them mini doses. You can call them whatever you want, but I don't know whether it's a microdose. So this is the issue of microdosing. We have very little data on what this is. How does the LSD experience compare with the psilocybin experience? There is no direct Data there are no direct data comparisons. In the 60s, there have been one or two studies comparing the two states. We have no modern data on uh, these valid psychometric instruments that we use today. We just compared indirectly the state that we measured with LSD in our scale in Basel with measurements from Zurich using the exact same scale in healthy subjects, and you can see the highest dose of psilocybin that they use. This is typically around 25 uh, micro, uh, milligrams compared to uh, 200 micrograms of LSD. LSD is much stronger, especially regarding the visual, uh, the visual effects. There is also more bliss than with psilocybin, but of course this needs to be assessed directly in the same subjects. And it will be interesting to know this because there are therapeutic studies with LSD and others with psilocybin, so we need a direct comparison. 
On the other hand, ketamine, which is also used as a fast-acting antidepressant, you can see that you would not have the, the synesthesia and not the bliss that you experience with psilocybin or LSD. On the other hand, you have the same amount of anxiety and you have more feelings of being out of your body. So acutely, this is not a pleasurable experience, at least not compared to what the other substances do, and it's certainly a different substance. Um, again, the difference between MDMA, LSD and amphetamine, now measured in the same subject, within the same study, 28 uh, volunteers had uh, all three substances and placebo, and we could directly compare the effects, and LSD is much stronger. You can see this again. 100 micrograms of LSD, higher ratings. But, um, MDMA produced some bliss, but none, I think none of the other scales ratings were actually significantly increased, and nothing with amphetamine. So it's truly a different and more impressive state. Um, what about these mystical type experiences? We have assessed them with the high dose of LSD in healthy subjects and in patients. Actually, the data is from the study done by Peter Gosser, so we have data from patients and healthy subjects. And I would say overall, they experience the same amount of whatever this is, this, this mystical type experiences, uh, patients and healthy subjects. High changes, however, again, MDMA in healthy subjects, here it's a lower dose, or uh, Ritalin, a stimulant, not, 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 not much of a change. Um, what are these mystical type experiences? It's listed here. It's not typically religious, what, the, what this refers to. It's feelings of uh, unity between the inside and the outside, maybe a little bit of sacredness, feelings of insight, a lack of body or body control, um, feelings of being part of something bigger or of a pure, feelings of a pure being, being one or connected. Then there is the positive mood um, dimension of bliss. So this is very similar to the oceanic boundlessness or bliss scale in the others, in the five dimensions of altered states, uh, uh, states of consciousness scale, transcendence of time and space, and then the fact that it's difficult to describe what people experience. And these mystical type experiences were a predictor of the therapeutic outcome in the Griffith studies. Whereas the five dimensions of altered scales of consciousness um, ratings were a predictor in the study done by Nott and uh, Robin Carhorteris. So we were wondering, well, maybe it doesn't really matter if it's specifically mystical. Maybe it's, uh, it's just the overall experience if it's, it's positive. And we used both scales in our healthy subjects and looked at the correlation between these two ratings. And indeed, if you look at the mystical effects questionnaire that was used in one, of, in one set of therapeutic studies and the five dimensions of altered scales, consciousness scale, um, oceanic boundlessness, which is overall bliss, uh, feelings of insight, it's just everything that's pleasurable as compared to anxiety. This, the scale ratings in this scale were highly correlated with the total score in the mystical effect questionnaire. So we had a correlation coefficient of 0.9, meaning they, they essentially measured the same or a very similar construct. They just label it differently. Um, on the other hand, we also looked at emotional effects produced by LSD and MDMA, and there saw some similarities. So the ratings of happiness are typically increased with LSD, dose dependently, a little bit more with 200 micrograms than with 100 micrograms. So people are really feeling happy, and this lasts over the entire day. And you see the same amount of happiness here with MDMA, smaller dose, and the highest therapeutic dose that usually is also used in clinical study for PTSD. Very similar, although of course the LSD effect is lasting longer. 
then openness is typically observed at the higher dose of LSD and also at the higher dose of MDMA. Then closeness, feelings of being close to other people, increased at the higher dose of LSD, same for MDMA, also typically seen only at the higher dose or significantly only at the higher dose. And also feelings of trusting, trusting whatever the therapist, just feelings of, of more trust, present with MDMA as well as with LSD. And I would say probably these states could be beneficial in any type of psychotherapy, not irrespective of the indication. So maybe, um, for example, in Switzerland, I noted that LSD was often used in PTSD patients, although there are no, to my knowledge, no studies for this. But maybe... Uh, the similarity with MDMA could explain why LSD could also be used there. And there are no clinical data as far as I know. It's just a fact that it's being used and the psychiatrists tell me they think it's effective. Emotionally, LSD has other effects that are also similar to MDMA. Here we showed faces, emotions to our healthy subjects. Um, these are basic facial, facial emotions, like a face looking happy or sad or angry. And surprisingly, with LSD, you can still recognize all these emotions. It may be a little bit harder to, to maybe on the, on the computer to tell which emotion that you saw, but you're still able to recognize these emotions. However, there is a small deficit, typically with negative emotions. You will be less capable of detecting or decoding sad faces or fear. And the same is seen with psilocybin and with MDMA. And when in the scanner, when we show fearful faces in the scanner, typically, this makes the amygdala lighting up. So there is a fear-induced uh, amygdala activation you could say the amygdala is kind of a fear center. And interestingly, when we showed these fearful faces in the scanner, the amygdala response did not increase, but was decreased with LSD. So LSD had an anxiolytic effect on fear-induced amygdala activation. And this correlated also with the subjective effects of the subjects. It's rather surprising. Finally, also some more data from the scanners. Um, you can define several networks in the brain, resting state networks. And with LSD, these networks are less separated but more, but more interconnected. So whenever you see a small asterisk in the, on the green or yellow quadrants, this means there is a higher connectivity between these two networks, so more connectivity overall in the brain. The same has already been shown by Robin Carhart-Terris. The networks are less integrated within themselves, but more connected with other networks. So there is less segregation between usually separated resting state networks. An increased connectivity. You can also take one important area in the brain, such as the thalamus, which is connected with the cortex, and just look at how is the thalamus connected with other brain areas, and you see a huge increase in connectivity with LSD. If you give an opioid or a benzodiazepine, this would all be blue, meaning less connection. So this is also an expression of the hypervigilant state and the attentiveness that we see with LSD. So it's not a... Uh, a, a, a decrease in the state of consciousness, but rather an increase, increased connectivity. And this correlates with the visionary restructuralization, so the perceptual changes that the volunteers express. And it could be a correlate of, of the synesthesia that they experience, more connectivity between areas that are usually not so much connected. Finally, this is something very pharmacologically. We look at the plasma concentration. So this is something that the regulators would, re would, would ask for if you want to make LSD a medication. They will ask, uh, how is the plasma concentration in the blood and what's the relation between this and the effects? 
and we see the plasma concentration rapidly uh, goes up. It peaks at one and a half hours, and then there is a half-life of 2.6 hours, and it then declines towards the end of the day. And what you can see here is that the effect is following very nicely this path of the plasma concentration. So the effect time curve mimics the plasma concentration time curve. Higher effects with the higher dose and also longer lasting effects with 200 micrograms. We have a 12 hour trip with 100 micrograms. We see an eight hour trip. So the biggest difference here was actually the duration of the experience. And then of course there is a, quite some variability between the different subjects. So each line here is a subject among 28 subjects. The dark line is the mean. And this, this is the variance in plasma concentrations that we see over 12 hours. And this then translates in different any drug effects, good and bad drug effects for each subject. So again, you see even more variance in the drug effect Good drug effects, high in most subjects, but the sum are only at 25% here. And the bad drug effects never go higher than 50%, but there is also huge variability. And of course, one of the questions will be, what's the reason for this variability, for this variance? What's the reason first for the variance here? Are there cytochrome enzymes that differently uh, metabolize LSD in certain subjects? Are there genetic reasons why this is present? So this will be needed to be investigated. So for MDMA, we have already done this, but not for LSD. Uh, and then what are the set and setting factors that then trigger more positive or more negative responses in association also with the plasma concentrations? And Patrick Wisely will give a talk on predictors of MDMA effects. So this is essentially the same question for MDMA. And uh, amazingly, the pharmacology is the most important determinant. So we see a very close link between higher concentration and higher effects, especially within a subject. So if somebody has a high effect and then the plasma concentration drops by 50%, the effect also drops by 50%. A close link, especially for LSD. This is not the case for MDMA. So if we plot the concentration against the effects, for LSD, whenever you have a high concentration, you have a high effect. And then here it goes down over the... So these are the means from 16 subjects. Then the concentration goes down and the effects go down. For MDMA, over 20, 40, and 60 minutes, the concentration and the effect increase. At 90 minutes, the concentration almost peaks, but the effect already peak. And then we see a rapid drop of the effect. After six hours, the MDMA experience is passed. However, the concentrations of MDMA are still close to maximum here. So there is an acute rapid tolerance to the MDMA effect. And we think that this is the release of the serotonin. MDMA releases endogenous serotonin and this produces the effect. And once the serotonin is out of the neurons, you can add additional pills here. It doesn't matter, I would argue. It does not prolong or intensify the experience because there is already a lot of MDMA in the blood and in the brain. Why would you add pills? There is no more serotonin to release. I would say this is completely different for LSD. My assumption is if you add LSD, it will prolong the experience because it's closely linked to the plasma concentration. No acute tolerance. This is not to say that if you take it repeatedly every day, there may be tolerance, but not up to 24 hours. Not at all. Nothing. It's interesting. Okay. Um, I'm getting close to the end and give an outlook on the studies that are ongoing. Um, we are currently, or we have completed an LSD dose response study, meaning that different doses of LSD were given to the same subjects, 25 to 200 micrograms. So this is essentially the same that has been published now for the low doses, for the higher doses that are therapeutically relevant. So the question will be, do we really need to give 200 micrograms? Maybe 100 micrograms is enough. Maybe they have less anxiety compared to an almost identically pleasurable state. We don't know yet. 
we compare LSD and psilocybin in the same subjects. So uh, each participant will uh, come for five days, 24 hours in the lab, gets 100 micrograms of LSD, 200 micrograms of LSD, two weeks later, psilocybin, 15 milligrams and 30 milligrams. We went a little bit on the high side for the psilocybin because we think that the LSD is stronger uh, than the psilocybin, so the high dose of LSD is stronger than 25 milligrams of psilocybin. There is a study by Peter Gosser and myself on uh, the use of LSD in patients with cancer and anxiety. 40 patients receive LSD twice. There is a follow-up uh, up to six months, and then they cross over to the placebo con uh, condition or vice versa. So each of the 40 patients gets actually both conditions and is in the study for uh, an entire year. 20 patients have cancer and anxiety. 20 patients only have anxiety disorder. And there, of course, they were uh, easier to recruit. Um, there is a study just um, authorized and starting to recruit on cluster headache. Finally, another one being in the planning phase on LSD in patients with major depression, also not treatment uh, resistant depression, major depression. They get two doses of LSD. They start with 100 micrograms. If this is enough, they can stay on 100 micrograms. If they think, no, I, 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 I haven't felt much, I want more, they will get 200 micrograms. And the placebo condition will, will be a small dose of 25 micrograms of LSD. So something they will experience, but we postulate this is not the full-blown experience, so it's likely not therapeutic, but we will see. And finally, we are um, just um, describing the acute responses in the patients that are in this compassionate use program in Switzerland. And this will be shown uh, in another talk by Jasmin Schmidt on Saturday. So that's it.